Welcome to everyone. Before we start, I always like to kneel and pray, ask the Lord to be with us and to use me because it's just him that is the one to share. So we can kneel. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We can come to your throne of grace that we can come and spend time in nature, just like Jesus did when um, he walked this earth that they gathered together and in uh, where the trees and the birds uh, are singing in the trees and just the fresh air. Lord, we're just grateful that we have that privilege. And we think about how Adam and Eve were meant to live in nature. And it's just really a blessing to come uh, and spend time with you. Thank you for bringing each and every individual here to this school. At this Thank you for calling me um, to come here as well. Just uh, the different events that happened are all providential. Just praising your name for that. And Lord, we just pray for a special uh, time together studying your sanctuary and how important and special that it is. Lord, I just pray that you will forgive me, cleanse me, purify me with the blood of Jesus so that I can uh, speak the words that you want to speak, that what's on your heart and mind, how you want to unravel the sanctuary story, Lord is so uh, fantastic. And I just pray that you will come and anoint my lips with a cold from off the altar of incense and just speak through me your words and not my own. Just cover us with your blood and robe of righteousness at this time. As we enter into your presence, Lord, we thank you and just praise you. We just pray now that um, you will speak to each heart here today. In Jesus' name we pray. So, God, uh, he just, um, created this sanctuary here on this earth in a special way because he is also visual and tactile where we can, you know, and the people of Israel, they needed something to touch and see and a three-dimensional object to, to experience God in a special way. And he's provided that for all of us, not just back then, but now we need that. We need to see this special sanctuary that he has created for us to understand in a, a, a better way the salvation story because the sanctuary is the centerpiece. It's the centerpiece of the universe. It's the centerpiece of God's government and kingdom. This is his house. His house that he's inviting us to. And it's the center of everything. If you read the Bible stories, it doesn't take long for you to know this if you're looking, that all the Bible stories revolve around the sanctuary being the center. And it was in the center of the camp, right? that all the tents were around that sanctuary. The sanctuary was a centerpiece. Why? Because it's about worship, about worshiping him. It's about connecting with him. It's about coming closer to him into his house where he dwells. This is his house. And we're privileged that he's inviting us to come in, to be with him and spend time with him and to live with him. You know, um, it's this house, he, he's talked about it being a dwelling place where you dwell. What is um, the word dwell mean? What's that? To stay. To stay and to live. That's right. Wherever you live, that is your dwelling place. And Jesus has a dwelling place also. And so our homes and where we're staying, even for this short time, is our dwelling place. And it's where we relax and be comfortable. It's mm -hmm. where we have fellowship with each other. And if you invited me to your dwelling place, to your house, would we just only talk about the furniture in your dwelling place, your couch or your chair or table or the bed, 
Is that the purpose of your dwelling place? No, it's for fellowship. You're going to sit down. You're going to talk to me and I'm going to talk to you. And I, and we're going to communicate with each other. We're going to relax. We're going to eat. Is there food in God's sanctuary? Yes, there is. There's a table, a table of showbread. There's bread on it. There is food in the most holy place. There's manna. There are almonds. There are, um, and there's water to drink at the labor. So in God's house, he has everything we need for sustenance. But when we eat together, when we sup together with Jesus, when we sup with each other, it's not uh, just about the food. It's about the relationship. Don't we talk to each other and, and laugh and um, bond with each other in that relationship? And that's what the sanctuary is all about. It's about relationship. It's about communication. So our sanctuary series is going to focus much more um, on relationship than you may have heard before about the sanctuary. How many of you have studied the sanctuary before? Has anybody studied the sanctuary? Okay, one person has studied. How many of you have seen a picture of the sanctuary before? Yeah. Have you have you seen a picture before? Oh, very good. So most of you have at least seen the picture. And a lot of times when people teach about the sanctuary, um, they talk about the furniture. Have you heard that before? And of what the priests do in the sanctuary, but not as much when I was a child, not as much about the relationship part of the study of the sanctuary. So that's what we want to focus on today. If we look in Exodus, Exodus is the very first time that we hear about this sanctuary. Does anybody know um, who was responsible for building this tabernacle sanctuary? Does anybody know? Who is responsible for the, the, besides God, God gave instructions to who to build this tower. Does anybody know? Okay. Moses, that's right. Moses was the one that God gave instructions. How many have heard about Moses being up on the mountain? And that he received something on top of the mountain in the cloud. Does anybody remember that story? When he re received two, two tablets. Yes. Of what were they made out of? Stone. Stone for permanent. It was something permanent. Two tables of stone. And the law was written on there. How was the law written on the stone? God's finger. That's right. He wrote on the stone. So you remember how he was up there on the mountain for a long time. And then he came down and brought the stone, two tables of stone for the people. Um, do you know how many days he was up on the mountain? Days and nights, he was up there for quite a long time. 40, 40 days and 40 nights. And while he was up there spending time with God and being so close to him, how many of you want to be like Moses? Oh, being so close to God the way Moses was. And can we be? Do we have the right to be? Absolutely. 
It says the last generation that we are going to sing the song of Moses and the Lamb, and that only the 144,000 are going to sing that song. So what Moses began being super close to God on the mountain, Jesus is inviting us, this last generation, all generations, but many times the other generations struggle to get as close. But that last generation, we're going to be able to get as close as Moses was to God. And the sanctuary is a big part of making that happen, that we get closer and closer to his house. In his house, we're going to dwell with him in his house. So Moses was up there for 40 days and 40 nights. What happened to the people of Israel at the bottom of the mountain? While they were waiting for Moses, what happened? They make the idol. They were worshiping idols. They um, drew away from God. And they said, Moses, where are you? And we don't know what happened to him anyway. And uh, but Moses was doing something very special during the 40 days and 40 nights. Was he only there to get the Ten Commandments? No, you know what else he was getting while he was there? He was getting all the blueprint and instructions on how to make the sanctuary. It was a very important time. Nobody knew about the whole sanctuary before then. Did did the people know about the altar of sacrifice though before Moses? Think about the Bible stories before in Genesis, because Exodus starts the Moses phase. So in Genesis, did they ever have an altar of sacrifice? I think they have an altar yes even at adam and eve right the very beginning the altar of sacrifice was established which was a part of the sanctuary mm -hmm. adam and eve wore the clothing of an animal that had been sacrificed representing jesus clothing covering us his death providing us a road of righteousness. So um, this altar is very important. Then we have other stories, even Abraham and Isaac. That's another famous story in Genesis of the altar of sacrifice and how um, Abraham needed to sacrifice his son, right? And lay down his son because do you think his son could have been a little bit of an idol to Abraham? That he might have like looked to this whole situation with Isaac to be the answer to the promise. And he needed to lay that down, didn't he? And sacrifice those things that mattered so much to him so that he put God first. God and God alone. And do you think Jesus wants us to do the same things in our hearts? To surrender everything to him. Lay it all down at the altar and let God be number one, which is the number one in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And so Abraham had to lay that down and all of us are being called to lay down anything that would stand between us and God and surrender it all to him. So the sanctuary message and all the puzzle pieces, all the parts of the sanctuary are essential for our, self, our salvation. It's just not only God's house, but it is the story of the salvation of mankind. Because what happened to us? We ended up falling. Adam and Eve ended up sinning and falling. And a salvation plan had to be put in place. 
And the sanctuary is the story of the salvation plan. All the parts that are needed. Do you know how many steps are in the sanctuary? There are seven steps. Does God like the number seven? Seven means complete. Seven is everything. We have the seven days of creation. The Sabbath being that final seal on our foreheads, right? The final connection. Isn't the Sabbath really about relationship also? Not only the sanctuary, but the Sabbath is about relationship. And we don't want to turn it into rules, all about rules. The scribes and the Pharisees were all about rules of the Sabbath. And Jesus was saying, it's about relationship. It's about me. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. You're going to spend time with me. You're going to bond with me it, with the Sabbath. And the same is true in the sanctuary. Step one, two, three, four, five, six, and then most holy place, number seven. You know the name of uh, the piece of furniture that is in the most holy place? It's not a very clear picture, but have you heard of the name of that piece of furniture? The Ark of the Covenant, exactly. It's the Ark of the Covenant where the Shekinah glory of the very presence of God was dwelling. So just like the Sabbath is number seven, the most holy place is number seven, dwelling close with Jesus, bonding close with him. And he's calling us, he says, I'm knocking on the door of your heart. I want you to open the door so I can sup with you and you with me are going to dwell. So, and inside the Ark of the Covenant is the Ten Commandments. Um, did any of you see inside of the Ark before and see the, the Ten Commandments? We'll show a picture. I have them here somewhere, but um, that we can do that on another another day inside was that those two tables of stone that Moses had gotten on the mountaintop and where did he keep them he kept them in the ark of the covenant that ten commandments was a covenant for us to connect with God just like do you know any covenants that we use today in relationships the marriage covenant. That's right. It's a promise of love, a promise of relationship and bonding and oneness. And so that's the marriage covenant. And Jesus says, I am to be your heavenly husband. And I want to make a covenant with you uh, of a deep relationship to restore what got broken between Adam and Eve. They couldn't be as close to God anymore today. They were, were not able to walk with him in the garden anymore and see him face to face anymore. And Jesus said, but I want to restore that relationship so you're bonded with me, one with me, just like Jesus and the Father are one with each other. He says, and John, I want you to be one with me just the way we're one each other and so the sanctuary steps is that complete um salvation process to bond with him now we have the um exodus 20 is where uh what is written in exodus 20 the beginning the first 17 verses mm -hmm. anyone the law of God, the Ten Commandments. That's right. <clears throat> Have you, how many of you read the Ten Commandments? You've read the Ten Commandments. Very good. And usually that's all we read in Exodus. We don't generally keep going 
But God had prepared his people, and I, we want to read a few of the extra verses after that. In Exodus 19 is where God called them to be prepared, like a, almost like a Sabbath day. They were supposed to clean their tents, clean their clothes, take a bath, get all ready. They put a fence around the mountain because it was holy, and no one or animal was supposed to go too close because if we get too close to God while there's still sin in our lives, then what would happen getting to the mountain? What would happen to us? We would die. That's right. And Jesus loves us. He doesn't want us to die. And so he um, wanted them to come close. And then he, oh, Exodus 19, 19. I have that underlined. And it says, as, um, and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The trumpet was just to call them to the mountain. Do, 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 it's time to come. Just like you have the bell that you ring in the morning time saying, it's time to come. It's time to get together. And that's what um, uh, the trumpet was to call them. And you know, there's even trumpets for God's last day people that tell us that Jesus is coming soon. And those trumpets, when you study all about the trumpets, you'll see that it is things that happen in the world that show signs that he's coming again. Have you been hearing those trumpets? That the world is, is in distress and it's time for Jesus to come again? Absolutely. And we're being called to the mountain of God. We're being called to come close to him. He wants to speak to us. He wants to speak to us from the sanctuary, from the mountaintop, speak to our hearts very deeply. So the people came and they gathered around and they heard God's voice speaking. And you know, this is uh, one of the very few times that God the Father came to this planet. He came in the beginning at creation. And this was the second time he came. He came to the cross when Jesus was dying. And he's going to come again. He comes to get the God's people. So those are four times that I can think of. It. God the Father came. God the Father came down and he spoke to the people. And it was kind of frightening and scary for them. Because after all the Ten Commandments, look what it says in verse 18. It says... When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, whoo, that's the biggest fireworks display you will ever see. Guess what? They trembled with fear. This was scary to them. They had just spent a long time being slaves, right? Now they come out to worship God. And it got scary for them. They trembled with fear. And guess what happened? It says that they stayed away at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Did they, did they, had they already heard God's voice? They had, they heard him say all the Ten Commandments. Did they die yet? No, they had not died. They did not need to say that. Um, and then they told Moses that if Moses spoke to them, that they would listen to Moses. Did they listen very well to Moses? Yeah, not really so good. Did they? <laughs> they didn't really listen that well to Moses. And um, so they didn't understand that they needed to be listening to God and following God and that Moses was his special shepherd and servant there for them, but that God is first. They don't, we don't need a human being like a priest or a pastor to be between us and God. We are each one of his children and we can go to our father, connect with him and worship him and bond with him. Moses said the, to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you 
to keep you from sinning. Ah, so God's voice, when we listen to him, that will help keep us from sinning. Does that make sense? Can we do it in our own strength, be overcomers? When it comes to sin, can we be overcomers in our own strength? No, we need to do what? We, we need to listen to his voice and walk in his uh, footsteps, to walk in the light, listening to him, morning by morning, day by day, hearing his voice. What is one of the ways that we can do to hear his voice better? Pray, that's right. Prayer is one way, and it's not to just be a one-way conversation where I just do all the talking. We can also be very quiet in our prayer time and listen to his voice speaking to our hearts and touching us. Another way is to read the Bible because these are his words. He is the word, right? Jesus is the word. His spoken word was written down for us to read. And then when we read the scriptures, we can be listening as the Holy Spirit makes it meaningful to our hearts. Very meaningful, deep inside of our hearts as we listen to his voice speaking to us through his word. So I can just read this Bible and just, you know, like a regular book. And that's okay. It's a reg it can be like a regular book too. It's got everything in there. But this is a living one. This is Jesus. The author of this book is alive. No other book is like that where the author is alive and right beside you in your worship time, ready to speak that word directly to you and to your heart. No other book is like that. If I write a book, I'm not going to be with you when you read that book. I hope to read a, a write a book one day. But Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is with you to speak to you. Mm -hmm. And um, I find that one thing my mother taught me when I was young is that she said, don't stop reading until you find something that really touches your heart, that mm -hmm. kind of jumps out at you. That God is speaking to your heart. That's listening to his voice. And there are some special places you can go that are easier to start with. And that is the book of Psalms, the book of Isaiah, and the book of John, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are good starting places. If you have not experienced a lot of that yet, Start in those easier books. Um, not that you can't read anywhere. And it's nice to even read all through the Bible. Like to have a Bible reading plan. But that doesn't, a Bible reading plan does not replace the fact, fact that you need to just kind of let yourself read through some of these easier books. So that you hear some special promises jumping out at you. God giving you a promise for you that day that you can take with you for the entire day. So I wanted to um, encourage you in that as we um, study the sanctuary. And we're actually going to go over that a little bit again in the near future. But <clears throat> I want to finish this part here where it says that Moses is calling out to them and saying, don't be afraid. Come connect with God. Listen to his voice. Bond with him. But what happened in verse 21? It says the people remained at a distance. They did not come close. While Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Was Moses afraid of the darkness there that was protecting God from killing everybody? He was not afraid. So instead of going away, he came to that 
God in that place. So this choice is for us too. How many of you want to be like Moses and approach him? Absolutely. We don't want to draw back. We want to approach him. And that goes all the way to seven steps that we draw closer and closer in intimacy until we get into his presence like Moses did in the most holy place. Because you and I are called to be kings and priests. And where do priests get to go? They get to go inside the sanctuary. Did the common people get to go in? No, only the priests. But now because of Jesus Christ coming and dying on the cross, every single person has the privilege to be one of the priests, to go in. And to know more and more about the sanctuary. And we're called to be kings and priests for eternity. Eternity, we're going to be priests. And where do priests get to go for eternity? Inside God's house in heaven. How many of you knew that there is a heavenly sanctuary? Did you know about that? This is the earthly picture of the heavenly sanctuary because um, God told Moses I think it is right here. All right. Exodus, Exodus 25 verse 8 is the next verse that we need to look at. So I'm going to back up. Got a little bit ahead of myself. I'm going to back up to say that after the people were afraid and were at a distance, God did not give up on them. And look what he says in Exodus 25, verse 8. Does anybody want to read that? Do you have the English Bibles? Or do you have um, to, to read out? You want to read? Exodus 25, verse 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Very good. Isn't that what we've been talking about, right? He said, let them make, and this is God speaking. Have them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So here was this whole center of their encampment. He was dwelling with them. Instead of staying loud on the mountain and, and all that thunder and lightning, now it's safe and quiet and peaceful inside the sanctuary. They could come and get close to God and worship at this sanctuary. <clears throat> and that's what he's calling. He's calling for us to dwell with him in the sanctuary. David talked about this a lot in the Psalms, dwelling in the sanctuary with God. And the next verse now says, make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Where does this pattern come from that Moses was given? The heavenly sanctuary, the heavenly sanctuary. And we can flip over to Hebrews chapter eight. That makes that really clear for us. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's Hebrews chapter 8. Yes, and we're going to read um, through the first, like, first five verses. Or so, Does everybody have that? Excellent. I'll start. Um, I'll start reading. I'll read verse one. It says, "The point of what we are saying is this." And the first um, part of this verse, this section, we're going to see how it's talking about Jesus is our heavenly high priest. And where do priests serve? Where do they serve? A sanctuary. So where does our heavenly high priest, Jesus Christ, where does he serve? 
in the heavenly sanctuary. That's right. This is only a copy to just show us of the glories of heaven and God's house up there. And that's where it says, we do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. This is God's throne room where he lives. Um, and maybe we could have, would someone like to read verse 2? Oh, the Lord pitched and not man, the true tabernacle. That's where he served. He says he serves in the sanctuary, the true one that was not built by man down here on this earth. Then um, we're going to skip down to verse 5. Would someone like to read verse 5? Oh, listen to that. Does that make sense? Isn't that a powerful verse? It's, and I'll just read it one more time. It says they, meaning the earthly priests, they serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. Did we just read that verse about how he was warned to do that, to make it as, as a, uh, everything that was shown to him? He was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So this is a shadow of the heavenly sanctuary. And Jesus is calling. Jesus is calling us to be priests in this heavenly sanctuary and we're preparing now mm -hmm. by studying about it and learning it is so i want to use a big word multifaceted it can be said we're going to study it probably for eternity it has so many um ways of studying about god's house um and now we use the time we need to prepare for that and understand the uh salvation story there and then the ministry for eternity we're going to do as priests. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, and we'll start with verse 4. Yes, and it says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God. Who's that? Who's this special stone? It's Jesus, isn't it? And precious to him, you, that's talking about us, right? You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Is he calling us to be priests? He's building us into this spiritual house, which, by the way, is the temple of the living God. Offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Jumping to verse 9. Would somebody like to read verse 9? But you are two same generation. A royal priesthood a holy nation. His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him. Who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light? Oh, beautiful. Isn't that powerful? He's calling us to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And as priests, we need to be in the sanctuary. We need to be connecting with him there. Is that something that each one of you want to do? Is connect with God mm -hmm. in his sanctuary, in his dwelling place. Praise God. Thank you. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful 
that you are inviting us to dwell with you in your dwelling place, that you're willing to dwell with us and be with us, and you're inviting us to be with you. We thank you and we praise you for that. And even though it was hard for the people of old that you are calling us to be a part of the chosen generation, a royal priesthood, to have that opportunity to come all the way in the deepest relationship possible for your last day people, because you want to, uh, you want to come very soon and that you want a group of people that are ready to be translated and to spend eternity with you without seeing death. We thank you, Lord. Help us to be able to sing that song of Moses and the Lamb throughout eternity in a special way as we follow you step by step in the sanctuary. In Jesus' name we pray.